start time. I, I've been reflecting uh, quite a bit on Mr. Kylo's recent message. I know that with uh, Dallas and, and Sherman to some degree, a lot of folks are on the road at different times. I don't know how many of you have, have heard that message. I think most of us have. But he talked about uh, the quarterly message. He talked about the subject of, of, of judging righteous judgment. And he's, he mentioned uh, several areas that impact our ability to be able to judge righteously. Well, I've been, been thinking about that, uh, in, in, in particular, three of those. As, as I was doing some Bible study uh, last week and then into this week, uh, something a, a term jumped out at me that, that tied in some of the concepts that he discussed last time with this whole discussion of, of judging righteous judgment, which, which he ended by saying in, in the message that it's, it's hard, it's really hard to judge righteously, but we, we, are, we, are, we are to do so. But he spoke about jurisdiction. I thought jurisdiction was, was an interesting way to a address it, that no kind of determining what, what areas fall outside of our jurisdiction and what areas fall within uh, our jurisdiction. And we are to judge those things, but be very careful about judging things outside of our jurisdiction. He also talked about rushing to judgment, uh, and we can fall into that category. But the one that, that hit me and impacted me the most was his last point, on, on our, our need to self-judge, and are we, are we self-judging? Well, one of, the, one of the things that I want to cover today, or the, the main topic that I want to cover, hits, hits all three of those. Uh, we know that we're, we're to bring into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ. Uh, we know that. Uh, I'd like us to consider this term in our own lives today and, and spend some time reflecting on it as we go through this. Uh, do we fall into this area that can really, really complicate our ability to judge righteously and also uh, take us in areas that uh, become even more difficult to manage? I believe that this topic is, is one of Satan's more subtle devices. <laughs> One that he comes in at us from this angle and it sneaks in, but then it begins to, to take hold of us and takes us in some bad directions. Uh, this device of his can work as an entry point, I believe, to, to a multitude of sins. I've seen it happen uh, in, in, in people's lives. I've seen sometimes when it, it slipped into my life and, and caused uh, issues. This, this device or this this problem uh, also speaks of, of Satan's nature at the very core. Let's go to Isaiah 14. Very, very, very familiar passage. We can go Isaiah 14. We could go Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel 28. But let's look at Isaiah 14 to draw this out. I hadn't considered it uh, this way before. As, as I, I looked at that, it, it's, isn't it interesting how you read passages and passages that you've read uh, as a kid uh, on all the way through and then a different element of the passage jumps out at you and this one this one jumped out at me so he's talking about the fall of the king of Babylon and then it shifts and and it's a clear shift as as we see a different kind of description uh, in, in one respect the, the king of Babylon was in a sense a type uh, of, of what we're to see here as, as, he gets, as he begins talking about the leader of the demonic realm. Verse 12 of Isaiah 14, how, are, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, O, o day star, uh, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. How, how does Satan weaken the nations? How, how do you think he weakens the nations? We know that he's the God of this world. We know that uh, the final resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the power that the, the beast and the false prophet uh, have and the influence and the miracles that they are able to do come directly from the power of Satan. It's according to the workings of Satan. We know those kinds of things. How does Satan, who is the God of this world, how does he weaken the nations? How are the nations weakened by him, this, this, this person who rules, who rules over, over the earth in that respect? 
Well, I, I uh, you know, I, and, I, and I think about the, the various nations down, down through the ages that have been weakened by him. We think about the Tower of Babel, Nimrod, and, and all that they were doing. Let's, let's, let's build this up to where we can, uh, if, as, as some, some think, as I, what was it in Josephus or one of the areas where they think, well, okay, maybe we can build something up that a flood can never destroy, it. we're up so high, or, or seeing themselves, exalting themselves up to the level of, of God. Uh, but, but we've got that, judgment, that, uh, that country. We've got Egypt. Uh, Egypt, a, a country that, uh, that in their time, in their power, in their authority, the Pharaoh was, was seen as a, a, a god-like figure. Uh, Assyria with all of its cruel power. Babylon, you, we know the story of Nebuchadnezzar seeing himself as this great, great being, and then God's got him chomping on grass for seven, uh, seven years uh, to, to let him know, no, uh, you, you thought you were this, you saw yourselves as, as this, as we see with Babel and, and, uh, and Egypt, but, he, but in a sense, he's weakening the nations. And, and how does he weaken the nations? Well, the answer is, and this is what jumped out at me, uh, the answer is found in, in verse 13, in, in uh, one of S Satan's subtle devices, but, 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 in, but in a way that is who he is to the core who he is to the very core. He says in verse 13, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. What, what do we see with, with some of these nations? Yeah, we, we, we are, we're here. We, we are the powerful nation. We are the ones that got ourselves here, and we're going to put ourselves up here. And, and in a sense, though, it it weakens the nations because they don't see their, their strength is in God. Satan saw his strength and his, his might and who he was and his influence. And who's God to think that he can do this? I, I can do this. I, and I'm, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to ascend above the heights of the cloud. I'm going to be like the Most High. The topic uh, today is presumptuousness. Presumptuousness. I, I think of, of the story of the Tower of Babel. I, I think when we think of how could Satan or Lucifer, the, the day star, this cherub that is one of the cherubs that was, was at one point covering the very throne of God, as is typified by the, the mercy seat at, at the Ark of the Covenant where these, the, the two cherubs on e either side, are the two cherubim are, are, are covering over the throne of God, how could he have gotten to that point uh, to be presumptuous enough to think that he could go to that level? So I, I want to talk about presumptuous today, and I'd, I'd like us to consider this as we ask ourselves, as I, as I ask myself. Uh, this is the title, Am I Presumptuous? Are you presumptuous? Are there ways in which you or I are presumptuous? Merriam-Webster.com uh, defines presumptuousness in, in, in several ways. Uh, it, it can mean a variety of ways and is used in a variety of ways. Sometimes it involves overstepping due bounds. Satan overstepped due bounds. In, in the building of the Tower of Babel, what they were doing, they were overstepping their own boundaries. They were taking liberties. That's another way of saying it. Going beyond what is proper. Uh, Another uh, synonym is audaciousness, having the audacity to, to think, to say, or do something that, that's bold or in an arrogant disregard of normal restraints, to go beyond that. Do, do any of us, uh, does, does anyone here, fall into that state sometimes of being presumptuous? Another synonym will be, would be cavalier. Cavalier about something, ah, it's not a big deal. I can do this. I can do what I want. I don't need to get any approval from this person. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because that's what I'm going to do. That's what I want to do. Uh, that's what we're talking about in, in presumptuousness. Uh, there, there are some other elements, but I, I think a case could be made to say that all of these, to varying degrees, stem from the root element of arrogance and pride. Uh, heard, you've heard many sermons over the years on, on the subject of arrogance and pride and, and obviously seeing Satan as, as the, 
a central figure in, in what's prideful behavior. But I want to focus on presumptuousness today. Let's turn to what would be considered an anchor scripture. Some of you would be ahead of me on this. Let's go to Psalm 19 and we'll read verse 13 today. It speaks to the seriousness of, of presumptuousness, overstepping our bounds, taking liberties, uh, making uh, presumptions about things, uh, maybe things that are outside of our jurisdiction. Uh, so s- several things we'll hit on today, but let's go to Psalm 19, verse 13. He, he first talks about, uh, we, when we cover this passage, we usually hit, hit both of these concepts that uh, are, are being discussed here. <clears throat> so here was a Psalm of David, Psalm 19, verse 13. Uh, let's go to verse 12 actually verse 12 so who can understand his errors you know can can we who can who can really grasp uh in terms of i I guess we could we could use the same phrase as as mr kylo uh, covered in his last point who can self-judge who who of us can really and truly self-judge are we in the position where we self-judge and self-judge righteously who can understand his errors he says, cleanse me from my secret faults, those, those concealed thoughts that we can have, those, the things that are kept close to us that maybe no one else knows. God knows, but no one else knows. He says, cleanse, cleanse me of those things. And then he says in verse 13, keep back, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins, sins that are where we're too bold, we're taking too much for granted, we're, we're showing an overconfidence and we're taking liberties. He says, keep me back from those kinds of things. I, I, my, my tendency can be to go towards that. Please, God, keep me back from stepping into that territory of, of, of what are presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, he says, and then I shall be blameless. I shall be innocent of, of great transgression. <laughs> Presumptuousness leads, if left unchecked, into great transgressions, transgressions that have horrible consequences. So I'd like to, I'd like to look at that today. Uh, we'll discuss it a bit more. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, some ways that, that we can fall into a, a sp- what I guess we could call a spirit of presumptuousness. Uh, Satan is a spirit. His nature, his core is uh, presumptu- is, is, is to be presumptuousness, I, so I say that intentionally, but it, it represents, it's an attitude, it's, it's a, get in this attitude, get in this spirit, uh, to, to stay clear of, of this spirit of presumptuousness, and, and in doing so, I hope we can address some ways to combat it, to combat presumptuousness. Now, as we cover these, all of these kind of bleed into one another, uh, they all connect with one another, so it's, it's kind of hard to to pull them out that, uh, separately, but they are slightly different. So, so, so let's look at that today. And before jumping in, I, I really would ask us to all consider this in our own lives today. What, in what areas, or are there areas in my life where I've allowed myself to become a bit presumptuous as we look at the terms? Okay, so uh, going forward, let's deal with a, a couple of more terms for merrywebsters.com. One is, is to presume and one is to assume. Presume and assume. Both, both mean, as, as Webster talks about, to take something as true. Uh, although presume implies more of a confidence or, or an evidence-backed reasoning. So I've got, I've got this piece of evidence and this piece of evidence and this piece of evidence, so I am going to presume this and draw this conclusion. Whereas uh, assume, on the other hand, tends to be more of, of a guess based on uh, little or, or no evidence. Uh, both, both terms are related, but uh, over the years, uh, again, I'll, I'll read, I'll quote from uh, American Dictionary of the English Language, 1828, uh, from which this article uh, states this, Noah Webster nicely distinguishes the different uses of the words. He defines presume as to take or suppose to be true or entitled to belief without, examine, uh, with, without examination or positive proof 
but or it could be on the strength of probability that again saying because of this this and this i i'm going to presume that this is the conclusion that we should draw and assume as to take for granted uh, without proof uh, to suppose something as being uh, exactly what it is as fact let's look at some pitfalls of of that i i will say this uh, as a as a caveat or as an aside some of the times, sometimes we hear that, that phrase uh, to uh, you know, presume innocent un until guilty. We're, we're not getting into, into that discussion. That's more of a legal thing, but we're, we're talking about those, those terms uh, just by themselves. Okay, so uh, the, the pitfall then, the, the first uh, pitfall with, with assuming and presuming is that we can, draw, we can end up drawing conclusions based on partial information. <laughs> Or, or, or in, in some cases, our, our best guess. We assume something without any info and then setting our minds on something and choose to take action or, 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 or it lends to this result. Do any of you do that? Do, do, you have, do, you, do you tend to assume certain things? Do you tend to presume certain things and then take actions based on that? Uh, it's, there, there are some cautions there. Let's think of some examples. We could, there are various ways that uh, presumptuousness can manifest itself. Let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about Haman. Okay, Haman, we've got Haman, uh, who is an Amalekite that's there uh, during Persian rule. Esther, Mordecai, uh, doing what they're doing. Haman hates the Jews. He hates Mordecai. He wants to shut them down. He's the top dog underneath uh, the Persian Persian emperor at the time, and and he is you know he has has very high status. People bow before him as he walks by. Mordecai doesn't do so, uh, and then at some point he's called before the king, and he's he's in the process he's determined how I'm going to take out these Jews. He's called before the king, and he makes some presumptions. Right, the presumptions are. I am, I am in this role under the king. He has given me all of this power to do this, all of this authority, and he's calling me here, and, and he starts talking about uh, we need to honor someone, and well, well obviously, <laughs> based on that, it would, it would, be, it would be me uh, whom he is, is going to honor. Uh, so he, he, he presumed that this would be the case based on, based on the things that he had seen. And instead, it was uh, the king couldn't sleep at night. And he uh, opened, uh, got somebody to get the histories out and, and read, read through the books. And he came across this story that he hadn't heard about, that at one point there was a person trying to take out the king. And this fellow by the name of Mordecai heard about it and reported it, and, and it ended up saving the king's life. Uh, so what is he about ready to tell Haman? Haman, I want you to get my best robe and, and what, what all the things, I should have read the story before, but uh, as I'm recounting this, uh, I gotta be careful, I don't wanna presume to know the answer, but, but, but that he, he, so here, here uh, you know, put him on this big horse, parade him through the city and, and go about and, and, and shout acclamations for him as, as he goes through the city. Oh, I really presumed wrongly here. Uh, it, 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 and that was not a, a pleasant time. But, but he doubled down on that. He gets called. Uh, Esther invites him. He's, he's called before this banquet. And he's thinking, well, look at this. I, I'm really, I am really the one. Wow. Just the three of us here. I'm with the queen and I'm with the king. And they're, they're calling me in. So it's, it's going to be wonderful because I'm, I'm an incredible person. Uh, and, and I can see why he thought that way because of all of the authority that he'd been given only to find out that he presumed wrongly. And it ended up uh, being that the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai were, uh, ended up being used for him. Uh, another uh, very, very dangerous or, or damaging way as we think about presumptions, uh, basing, uh, basing conclusions on certain, certain facts or, or certain things that we might know uh, that can be incredibly damaging to the church is, is at, at various times as a church, we become aware of situations with brethren. And, and, and sometimes they can be, that can be information that is not, it's not positive about that individual. That person may be working, uh, working on something in their lives or de dealing with this or that. But, but uh, we, get, we get information 
uh, that uh, that uh, has happened and then we we don't see that person or we see this or we see this and based on the information that we've heard and maybe this person has a bit of knowledge on something and, and shares that so then we begin to put this package together of, of what the situation is that's going on with this person and uh, based on and they could be some facts. They could be very factual of this, this is this situation. Well, I was there. I seen it. I was there. Uh, and this and this and then, then to draw this conclusion and, and then come to a decision where, oh, this person has not been taken. This person has not been dealt with properly. This should have happened or this should have happened or this should have happened where it's based on probable or, or, or some, some evidence, not necessarily just straight up assuming where I don't have any information and, I'm, and I'm, I've got an answer for this. I think I know what's going on and here's what it is. Uh, we, we see presuming that happens uh, more frequently than, than we, we would want it to. We care about one another, but, but sometimes we draw conclusions. Don't raise your hand if you've done this, uh, but, ha but think about this. Don't, don't move, but ha have, have you done that? Ha have I done that sometimes? It, yes, yes, I've done that. Uh, and I have made uh, presumptions uh, based on the information that I had. Uh, tell, tell you a quick story that, uh, that really helped, helped me strive to think differently on that. I, I remember uh, being in college uh, at, at Ambassador, and, and people messed up at Ambassador, and sometimes people got booted, uh, sometimes there was some pretty heavy uh, disciplinary action taken on, on certain situations, and you know, word, word kind of would travel, well, yeah, this happened over here, and this happened, and, and then, you know, here, here as a student, you're trying to piece this together, and uh, ah, boy, that seems kind of harsh, man, they came down hard on this person, or or uh, they didn't do anything. Well, what's that all about? That this happened over here with this person. And we, we begin to, I, I begin to sometimes make some judgments about some things and, and con conclude certain things and, and, and sometimes wonder, well, what, what are those people that are making these decisions thinking? You know, <laughs> I'm being a little uh, hyperbole here, but, but, but think, thinking about that, you're always kind of, kind of wondering. And uh, I later, uh, it was, it was a, couple of years after I graduated, I, I got, at, got to come back to one year after I graduated. I came back and worked uh, there at the college. And it was, I can't remember if it was in the early 90s, but at some point they, they offered, a, they set up a, a, new, a new system within the Dean of Students, uh, within the Dean of Students office. The Dean of Students was responsible for monitoring the behavior of, uh, and the conduct of, of the students. And, and then, you know, if there was a situation, they dealt with it. But, but in doing so, they set up an, a, a faculty appeals committee. And they, they appointed people to sit on that committee. And I was appointed. Uh, and I was a little nervous about that. And, but nobody ever uh, called on me. I, was, I think it was a couple of years before I got called upon. But uh, at some point, uh, I was called uh, to a situation. I had heard of a situation where a person got in trouble for something. I can't remember. I can't even remember what exactly the situation was. But individuals, if they felt that they were disciplined wrongly, had the, had the ability to appeal. So uh, they, they appealed to the appeals committee. So I, I had heard a little bit about the situation and uh, was kind of wondering ab about the decision, and, and I'd heard some students talking about, well, this happened to such and such, and I don't, I don't know if that was right. Well, okay, so the person appeals it. So then I, I came there, and, and there, there was a panel there, and all the material was, was brought out, all the material of everything that the individual had done, and it was very different. <laughs> I, I finally had most, if not all, of the information. And, and, when, and when, we saw, when we saw what the decision was made, I thought the person got off pretty easy, <laughs> where they were saying it, it was a completely, feeling like it was a completely different situation. What, what I'm saying is, I didn't have all the information. And then I got the information, all of the information from both sides, and, and it was all laid out before us. And it became very, very clear that it, that, that it was a right decision that was made. 
it, it wasn't uh, uh, overly harsh by any means. But it, that, that, that really hit me at that point because I thought of all the times that I've heard things or seen this or wonder why is this happening and allowed myself to begin to presume certain conclusions and make judgments instead of saying, why, why am I even going there? I don't know. I don't know all the details. I can pray for God to guide and direct uh, the decision making and, and, and that this person and with whatever he or she's going through can, can work this out and, and, and they can come to a, to a resolution or, or get this sorted out. But I don't know. I don't know all, all the details. So to reserve judgment uh, to, to the other individuals versus presuming is the way to go. That uh, it's difficult to do sometimes. Uh, because we, we know each other, we see certain things. Let's go to uh, an, another area of where partial information or, or presuming something, and this, this gets into uh, uh, another aspect of, of church-related matters in terms of those of, of us and that are in teaching positions, those of us that are up here at the pulpit, those of us that are out in situations where we're speaking and representing God, is this being our way of life? Let's go to Deuteronomy 8, 8, 18. Deuteronomy 18. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. I think we can pull several, several elements here that are powerful for, for all of us, uh, something that I think helps give me clarity on, on how, to, how to view certain things here. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, the Lord your God, the eternal your God, will, will raise up for you a prophet. So capitalized here, the English translators have, have capitalized that because it's, it's speaking as uh, I believe John 1 speaks about, speaks uh, to this, the prophet being Christ, Jesus Christ, the eternal your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. Moses, Moses was a prophet. Moses was, uh, in, a, in a sense, a type of Christ uh, in, in that he led Israel, but obviously under, under God, the one that was speaking, speaking to him through the burning bush was was the, the, the word of God, was, was Jesus Christ. But uh, like me, from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. According to all you desired of the eternal your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. We know that they wanted to, him to speak to Moses and then speak to them because of the fearful uh, experience that that was. So let's go uh, continue here. Verse 17, so the eternal said to me, what they have spoken is good. And, and then he says in verse 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and, and, will, put, and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. That's a powerful statement. That, that's God, God the, is saying here, he's going to work, it, what, he's going to work through this prophet to come and and he will put the words in his mouth that that he should speak and he will speak what i command him verse 19 and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words which he speaks in my name uh, i will require it of him let's keep your finger there for those of you that are using bibles and fingers for that uh, keep your finger there otherwise other fingers just start punching in John, uh, John 5. No, John 8. Sorry, I said John 5. John 8. <clears throat> John 8, verse, verse 25. John 8, verse 25. Then they, they say, I'm breaking into the thought here. Uh, he says, then they said to him, speaking to Jesus Christ, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things uh, to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And I speak to the world 
those things which I heard from him. Jesus Christ is saying, I, what, what it says of this prophet, of Jesus Christ is that, that prophet, I speak to the world those things which I heard from him which my father wanted me to speak. They didn't understand, verse 27, that he, that he spoke to them of the father. Uh, verse 28, then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but, but as my father taught me, I speak these things. So coming back then to, to Deuteronomy 18, of course, it's speaking of, of, of Jesus Christ in that role, and even Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God, the one who, with, through whom God created all things, these two God beings that are in perfect harmony with one another, working together at, at a level and, and a connection that is beyond our ability to even fully grasp. Even that person says, I, I do what the Father wants me to do. We are, we are in sync in that respect. Uh, he says, if you don't hear that, those words, I'll require it of him. Okay, verse 20 now. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. But, but the prophet, but the, prophet the, the person that is speaking forth as I am hearing this from God, and I, I think by extension, we can say, well, you know, you've got some that, that were false prophets. They are saying God's telling them this, and then I am foretelling the future by saying this is what I've heard from God but I think by extension we I don't think it is a stretch for us to to also take into account that we are representatives of God and when we speak of his way of life and when we're representing and in, in defending the faith and what we believe based on the word of God and as we're handling the word of God in, in our reading and in our minds and in our thoughts and as we interact with others this th th this bleeds into that uh, in our own lives uh, so Verse 20, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, a word which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, well, how shall we know the, the word which the eternal has not spoken? Well, verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing doesn't happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord, uh, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. He's, he's taken liberties on that. He's gone beyond what, what God had said to do. And he says, don't be afraid of them. Uh, we, we are not to fear those that are in these, these positions that are not speaking of the things of God uh, that are and either pulling us towards other gods, as, as it says in verse 20, or, or saying that things will come to pass that don't. He says, don't be, don't be afraid of those. Se several things to keep in mind uh, with that. Uh, is one is, I, I think, as, as a person who, who has to, who has to, who has the opportunity to get up uh, here to speak before you, uh, as, as James tells us, uh, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a greater judgment upon those who are, uh, a stricter judgment on those who are teachers. We, we who are up preaching and teaching God's word, it, it is, this, this is something that we say, uh, as the 1960s TV show says, this is danger, Will Robinson territory. This is be very, very careful here. And, and, and all of us at different times, you know, we may be thinking it may be this, but we've got to be very, very careful about speaking in such a way that God would consider it presumptuous uh, to do so. I, 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 don't, I don't think it's it, it would be appropriate for us to say, well, that only applies to the, to the preacher. That only applies to the pastor. That only applies to the sermonette speaker. It, it applies to all of us, I think, as, as we handle carefully the word of God and, and hopefully in our interactions with others, we are speaking the words of God and, and not, not going beyond that, uh, lest, lest we speak presumptuously. A next, a next point that I wanted to, to touch on uh, is is in a sense tied to this, but uh, a, a little bit different. Let's go to Deuteronomy 1. Uh, let us not get sucked in by the, the modern Christianity trap. Uh, God's called out ones uh, fall prey to this as well at times. 
God does not wink at presumptuous sin. He does not wink at presumptuous sin. When we think about that, the whole Uzzah situation here, uh, you know, what we could say, well, what, what did Uzzah really know about, about the, the, the whole situation of carrying the ark? They weren't carrying the ark properly in the first place. Uh, as, a, as a person who was there with, with that, they, they should have studied that and known that we need to carry those on, on staves and, and we've got the rings, but they were carrying it on a cart, uh, doing things that were not appropriate. Uh, and here that, that cart begins to, to, to tilt and here comes the ark falling off. And, and what does Uzza do? He goes to, to, to catch uh, and support the ark uh, so that it doesn't uh, you know, crash down on the, on the road and, and get damaged. And what happened to him? He died. He died. Uh, now, I, I think a case could be made that, well, he did, what did he really know? They, they didn't always have all of, the, all of the writings there or gone through them, but it, it was a bit presumptuous, was it not? It was a bit presumptuous for them to decide to take the ark and move it here without first reading, well, I think God has some instructions on that, if we remember correctly. Let's go back and look at that. Let's go back and look at that very, very carefully and make sure that we are careful to do it exactly as, as God would have us to do it. Uh, they didn't do that. He, he reacted immediately uh, to, to spare the ark from getting damaged, and yet it, it cost him his life. Deuteronomy 1, they, they, they had a, a similar situation. In this case, they really messed up. Uh, Deuteronomy 1 verse 34 Moses is recounting the whole situation about the about the, uh, the the spies that had gone in and and they said we can't do it these these giants are going to destroy us we're gas, uh, grasshoppers uh, in, in their sight verse 34 and the Lord heard the sound of your words as as Moses is recounting the story and was angry he took and took an oath saying surely not one of these men this evil generation shall see that good land of which I swore to give their fathers except for Caleb uh, he shall go because he wholly followed the Lord. Verse 37, the eternal was angry with me uh, for your sakes, saying, even you shall not go in there. We know that Moses acted presumptuously in, with that whole rock situation when he was told to speak to the rock and he beat it. Uh, and and that, that cost him, in effect, his ability to go in a, at that time. Uh, <clears throat> that, lo that Moses allowed his anger to... to spawn into a, a decision that was quick and, and, and presumptuous before God. Uh, verse 38, Joshua, the son uh, of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in uh, and encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones, your children, the ones you, you say will be victims, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. Uh, to them I will give it. And, and here they were all this time later, the 40 years later, and they're getting ready to go in now, these, these little ones that were uh, 40 years old <clears throat> and older. He says, verse 40, uh, he told them at the time, as, as Numbers tells us, then, then uh, but as for you, turn and take your journey into the wilderness of the way of the Red Sea. Here come the 40 years uh, of wandering in the wilderness until they all die off. And he says, verse 41, well, then you answered and said to me, well, yes, we have sinned against the Lord. Yeah, we, but, but we recognize that. We really messed up. We should have trusted in you. But now we're going to go, uh, go up and fight, just as the Lord our God commanded. So, yes, I know he said turn and go this way now, but, but God, we've had, we've had second thoughts. We recognize this. We messed up. We're, we're repentant of this. We're going to now trust in you, and we're going to go forward and and." and uh, conquer that land as you said you were going to give it to us originally. He says then, uh, in, and, and when every one of you had, had girded on his weapons of war, you were ready to go up into the mountains and, and do this. And the Lord said to me, he said, tell them, Moses, do not go up nor fight. I'm not among you, lest you be defeated before your, your, your enemies. So I spoke to you, yet you would not listen, but rebelled against the command of the Lord and presumptuously uh, went up and did this, willfully still choosing to say, no, this is the way we're going to view this because he originally said that we could make it and, 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 and achieve this. They did not follow God. They made a, a decision 
that was contrary to what God had said. And they went up to the mountains. Of course, the Amorites who dwelt in the mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do and drove you back from Seir to Horma. So uh, there, there is this, this, this feeling sometimes of, okay, yeah, I know God said don't do this, but now, now we're thinking this way and we're going we're gonna to do this anyway. And, and God, God will wink at that because now my heart is right. Now my heart is right to trust in you and go forward, yet, yet they're not clearly seeing and, and recognizing and, and, and following God based on what God has told them to do. He does not wink at that. Exodus 4 is, a, is another interesting story. I've always been kind of fascinated by, by this. It leaves out some things. We can, we, I, I've got to be careful not to be presumptuous in, in thinking what, he may be, what may be going on here. I, I think there are some clues here to this, uh, which, which could be another area of, of presumptuousness. It's in, it's in Exodus 4. <coughs> We've got the, the whole uh, burning bush uh, discussion and, and God working Moses through the understanding that Moses, you can do this, you and Aaron will do this, and I'll be with you, and you're going to uh, serve me mightily. So he says in verse 18, ex- Exodus 4, verse 18, <clears throat> So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Well, please let me go and, and return to my brethren who are in Egypt, and see whether they're still alive. Jethro said, go in peace. So the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are now dead. Moses had been out there for 40 years, so uh, they're all dead now. So Moses took his wife, his sons, and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. He also took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt... See that you do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I've put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Verse 22, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the eternal, Israel is my son, my firstborn. God is is teaching Pharaoh here that I am working through this people and I consider them my, my son, my firstborn. Verse 23, so I say to you, he says to Moses here, to to tell Pharaoh, let my son uh, go that he may serve me. Let let my peep, these people, that they may go and serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, indeed, I will kill your son, Pharaoh, your firstborn. So, again, a powerful statement. As as we know, that plays out, that the firstborn of Egypt are are ultimately killed and and they are released. But what I find uh, fascinating is, is what we see in verse 24 now. And it came to pass on the way at at the encampment that the Lord met him. Met who? Met met whom? Met whom? He he met Moses. He he met Moses and and sought to kill him. (laughs) Whoa, whoa. wait a second here. What's going on? And then Zipporah, this is, of course, Moses, Moses' wife. Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and, and cast it uh, off, uh, cast off the foreskin of her son, cast, and cast it at Moses' feet, and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So, so he let him go, and then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. What was going on there? Uh, as, again, it, it's not clear, but why would, why would God have sought to kill Moses? And, and, uh, and how, how did this play out and why did this play out this way? I, I think a, a, a possible answer to this is that Moses had been given the direction to, to circumcise his son and, and it had not yet been done. Was he leaving that to Zipporah to take care of and, and she hadn't taken care of it? But Moses, as uh, head of the head of the household had not seen that this had taken place yet that that he that he had been circumcised and and here God is uh, just talking about how he's going to show Pharaoh that these are my people and one of one of the the markers of of the people of Israel were were that the the males were circumcised Uh, one of the markers of, of us now as God's people is the circumcision of the heart if we're God's people we are 
We are to be circumcised of the heart, baptism, receiving of the Holy Spirit, uh, and, and the heart open uh, to, to God's, God's way and yielded and molded. And he hadn't taken care of that. Uh, I, I submit that part of that had to have been something with, for, for various reasons, Moses had not taken care of business. And when God says to do something, we are, we are to do it. We are not to mess with him. We are, not, we are to do it in haste. We are to do it speedily. And I, I don't, you know, you think about all these things that he's saying here about Moses. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. And then he's, he's coming at him in, in, in a situation where he's seeking to kill him. I, I, I think that's amazing. It's amazing. And it speaks to the degree to which one must, when we, we understand God's way, God holds us accountable for that. He expects us to follow that. Uh, and, and yet Moses hadn't done that. Did Moses, was he presumptuous in assuming that I, I'll take care of this eventually or, or delaying in that? Uh, we, we, we can do that sometimes. I can do that. So I know I need to do this. I know I need to be doing this, and I, and I know I, I need to be doing this. But at some point, we can, we can work in our minds, yeah, you know, I'll, I, I, yeah, I know that's important. I, I'll. Are, are we not saying, God, you wink, at, you wink at this thing that I know I need to take care of? It's, it's, it's dangerous ground, and God, God shows that there. We know, as, uh, as Scripture tells us, that we won't turn there. Let's, let's, let's do go to Deuteronomy 4. <clears throat> so some read these, these situations in, in the Old Testament, and they draw this conclusion, as I was trying to make in the second point. Uh, wow, this God was harsh. He was exacting. But in the New Testament now, look, wow, he's, he's merciful. Look, look at what he did with the, the woman caught in adultery. He wrote some things on the ground and, and, and said, now let, let those who's without sin cast the first stone. They walked away. Neither do I condemn you, adulteress. Uh, go and sin no more. And, and just uh, in a sense, it's, it's okay. And of course, we know go and sin no more is more than just, oh, just be who you are. It's okay. It's all good. We've got love and we've got mercy going on and, and it, it, it's all great. We see that that's not all great by the, the whole Ananias and Sapphira situation in Acts. Uh, they, they presumed they could do certain things and say things a certain way because they were giving and, and it, it would make them look good and everything would be all right and, and they would still do all right in, in keeping a little bit back. Uh, and we see both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, this is not something to, to fool with. In, we'll get to Deuteronomy here in, in just a second, in Deuteronomy 4. But think about the, the end of, of Hebrews 12. Again, we won't turn there, but in Hebrews 12, he's saying all these things happened in the Old Testament, and they came before God at the mountain and, and were fearfully afraid. And... and uh, concerned about the fire and if they even get close to to touch the mountain they'll be they'll be killed and he says but but we've got to think about it from a completely different perspective that was just a type of the reality in which we as God's people are and we're we're coming before the very throne of God God's allowing us to come into his presence into the holy of holies as we as we pray to him as as Christ is there at the right hand of God uh, as the, the angels are all about we're coming before this multitude of, of beings and in that presence. And he said, this, this, is, this is way more in, intense and way more impactful in, in everything that we're doing that we are to serve God than, than even what they had back then. They, they, they weren't given the, the, the heart to obey him, as, as it says in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 4 so it speaks to this with the, the opposite of presumptuousness, or one of the opposites of presumptuousness is, is covered here in Deuteronomy 4. Now, O Israel, he says, listen to the statutes and judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live. Go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. Uh, a type of their, their promised land, a type uh, for us as, as going into the eternal family of, of, of God, uh, becoming a part of that, the, our, our true homeland. Verse 2, you shall not add to the word which I command you. Don't add to it. Don't, don't take away from it that you may keep the commandments of the eternal your God, which I command you. 
Your eyes saw what I did at, at Baal Peor. For the Lord your God dis has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Peor. But you, but you who held fast to the eternal your God, you're alive today, every one of you. I've taught you these things, these judgments, these statutes, uh, just as the Lord my God commanded me, Moses says, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, here's the opposite. Be careful. Be careful to observe them. Don't become presumptuous. Don't, don't take liberties. Don't, uh, you know, wiggle my way around this. I don't know that I exactly need to do it that way. Uh, be careful to observe them. This is our wisdom. This is our understanding in the sight of all the peoples uh, who will, will hear us uh, as we are hopefully lights uh, to the world and the statutes and say, surely this, this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that, that has God so near to it as the eternal our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon them? I think about that now. What, what great nation is there that, that has God so near to it as the nation of the body of Christ, of all of us who are here today. Only take heed, verse 9, to yourself, judge yourself. Take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, the things, uh, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. I am excited to go see our grandchildren. I, but we're going to play a lot. But this, i got to remember this too. Uh, Stacy and Kelly are, are responsible before God to teach their two kids, but I've got a role too. And, uh, and, uh, but we're still going to have a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, looking, looking forward to that this Thanksgiving. Uh, so, so be very, very careful. Don't be presumptuous in saying that God winks at things that we, we really know in our heart and core. These are not things uh, to be winked at. Thirdly, when it comes to the subject of presumptuous, what about this axiom? What if, uh, what if I called you up here and uh, put you up here on the stage and just asked you, if you would defend or refute this axiom, what would you say? Uh, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Uh, where do you stand on that phrase? How, how, do, how do you and how do I apply that? Are there, are there positives to that? Are there negatives? Are there situations where that is is the way it should be. In business, they, they talk about the person that can, can see a situation and take care of it and, 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 and have a sense for what is right and wrong and what needs to be done and acts on it and, and that that's to be rewarded. Uh, but also in business, we have situations of uh, uh, where a person may act presumptuously and create all kinds of conflict. It seems like the right thing to do. I'm just going to go ahead and do it uh, and, and I recently read an article where, where it talks about uh, this axiom of actually, no, no, it, it, it's actually this way. But, but there, there are elements of, uh, of this. But how does it work spiritually? Can we think of some examples of where it, uh, it was not better to ask for forgiveness uh, than permission? And, and examples where uh, they moved on things quickly, and it was not considered to be presumptuous. We think about Phineas. Phineas was there. Israel, I think Balaam had gotten them all caught up in, in uh, uh, harlotry as they're worshiping false gods, and it's it, it's all really really bad. And Phineas here is part of the part of the the, the priesthood. He he comes in and he he sees this situation. The people that are involved in this harlotrous idolatrous, adulterous act in the presence of Israel and he takes the javelin and takes them out and God stays the plague and, and, and commends uh, Phineas is, is commended for, for asking, did he run that up the ladder? I think I need to check with, let's see who's above me and within the priesthood, I need to run this here and I run this here and run this up and let Moses take this before God. He saw the situation and he, he did it uh, and, and it needed to be done and and it was, uh, it was applauded by God. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Uh, 
King, we, we, they weren't disrespectful, but King, we are, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. This, this is, a, this is a, a done deal here. This is a, an easy answer. This is what we must do. We are not, we are not going to, to bow down and worship this. Uh, whatever happens, happens. But we're, they, they weren't acting presumptuously. They acted immediately. Now, now conversely, we see the situation of, of Saul and what uh, Saul did. Let's turn over to 2 second, second Peter 2. Uh, Saul had a couple of, of, of major gaffes in, in that respect. Uh, one was, okay, the, here, we're, we're battling, getting ready to battle the army uh, that's waiting to fight us. And, and Samuel says, wait, 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 I'll come and we'll, we'll, do, we'll do the offering. Well, Samuel delays. Uh, these people are starting to scatter. We're going to get routed. I've got to do something. He, pre- he acts out of presumption. And, and it was the wrong thing. It was the wrong thing. He, he acted out of presumption, and, and it cost him dearly. Uh, he did it in another situation. Destroy all of the Amalekites when you, when you fight them in this battle. Take out every living thing. Kill them all. Uh, and he kind of started thinking as, as they, they routed them. Well, they, they killed everybody except there's, there's, there's Agag. He's the king. He's their representative. This will be a humiliating thing. I don't know what all he was thinking, but uh, well, I'll, I'll keep him here, but everybody else will, will kill. And there are these oxen. They're, they're beautiful. The, the, we'll only keep the good ones, the lambs, the, the, uh, the fatlings, just, just the, the perfect. We, we could use those as sacrifices. We'll, we'll keep those. Uh, and it was not what, what he was supposed to do. He acted presumptuously uh, in, in making that decision to do that. Sometimes we've got to ask ourselves what, what's actually underpinning our actions in, in the it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission mindset. Sometimes, not always, but, but sometimes it can be an attitude as, as we see to some degree with with Saul, an attitude of uh, self-will. I, I, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I, I know he said to do this. I know this and that. I, I'm going to do what I want to do. That's, that's the bottom line. God, God does not like that. Versus a willingness to yield fully to God. And I'm going to add this because uh, this is an element as well that, that, that God that God. Uh, does a willingness to yield fully to God along with those he's placed in authority uh, we, we all are in situations where we are under authority uh, you're under authority I'm under authority uh, ultimately uh, the people who are uh, uh, dealing with the the ins and outs of the direction of the church they're on un- they're under authority uh, we're, we're all under authority uh, to one degree or another and if, if it is something that, that someone who is in authority over us is, is asking us to do or, or, or telling us to do, uh, that's not against God's law and, and it is part of, of our responsibility, uh, do we, uh, it's better to ask forgiveness than, than for permission. I know they've said this, but I'm, I'm going to go do this anyway, and then I'll deal with the, the whole forgiveness thing later. Uh, does, that, does that get, is that in you a little bit? Is it in some of us a little bit? Uh, it it kind of sneaks into me, and I have to see it and 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 kick it out when I, when I feel that or start thinking about that way. So it's very dangerous. That 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 is something that is totally not God. We see this here in Second Peter two verse nine. Second Peter two verse nine. That the Lord uh, speaking of of the righteous. That the Lord's no, Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of torment, and especially those, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority, they are presumptuous. They are taking liberties. They are are putting themselves up. They are self-willed, and they're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels who are greater in power and might, they don't bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Uh, something that, that Peter is talking about here, also Jude, that is, is very contrary uh, to that. Let's look at Numbers, Numbers 15. Numbers 15.
Does God view all sin the same? The passage in one of the epistles of John speak to, uh, I mean, all sin unrepented of ultimately leads to death. We know that doctrinally, but does God view all sin the same? I, I don't believe he does. And, and, and I, I say that through, through several, several passages. One here is in Numbers, Numbers 15. Like we say, in one respect, uh, all sin is uh, one who has sinned uh, deserves the death penalty, the eternal death penalty, unless that sin is repented of and that sin is, is covered, uh, expiated by the, the sacrifice of Christ. But there are degrees of, of, of certain things in the way God views it. And we see that here in Numbers 15 that, that speaks to this area of presumptuousness. Uh, Numbers 15, verse 27. Numbers 15, verse 27. He says, and if a person sins unintentionally, that can happen sometimes. We, 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 don't, we, don't, we, we don't recognize it was not our intent. We weren't willful in something, but it happened and, and we recognize that it was a sin. If a person sins unintentionally, then he shall bring a female goat in its first year as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for the person who sins unintentionally. When he sins unintentionally before the Lord to make atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him. He says, you shall have one law for him who sins un unintentionally, for him who is a native born as well as, as the stranger who dwells among them. Uh, so it's the same. Verse 30, but the person who does anything presumptuously, uh, verse, uh, presumptuously, the margin uh, renders that in a defiant way. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to take liberties on this, and I know that I'm taking liberties, I know that I'm doing this, uh, but the person who sins, uh, who does anything presumptuously, whether he's a native born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the eternal. We think about that uh, if, if we do something willfully like that. We, we're bringing reproach upon, upon God. And it says, and, and he shall be cut off from among his people. Why? Because it, it's evidence that of, of where the person is in the heart. It, and and here's, here's how it's, it, it manifests itself, verse 31. Because he's despised the word of the Lord. Despised, I cast it off. It doesn't mean anything to me. I don't care. I know it says I'm going to do what I'm going to do. He's despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be upon him. Do you think that's any different now since we're under the new covenant? Is that any different? Again, here we are uh, coming before uh, God in his presence. Uh, I, I submit to you that it's no different. It's no different. If our attitude is such, like a, a presumptuous attitude, it is no different uh, with God. How, how does Christ's shed blood cover that kind of sin that the person says, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. And now, now Christ, uh, have your blood cover my sin. It doesn't work that way. Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 Tells us that we tells us that we we can't we can't play with those kinds of things. Let's wrap this up. We'll go to uh, two final final verses here. Let's go to uh, Psalm one forty one. When we think about uh, presumptuousness, presumptuousness can happen with those of us uh, who are in leadership, and, and many of us here are in our families, in, in the workplace. Uh, it can happen with those who are under, those who are in, in authority. How does it work uh, with those under authority that, that choose to go against uh, or, or take liberties? Uh, well, we've, we've covered that already. Uh, but, but we can also, as those who are in authority, we can sometimes be presumptuous uh, in working with those who are, are working under us. I, let, me, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, I, I had this happen to me recently. I got this worked out with this person. But I, I had uh, an individual that was on the speaking schedule, uh, had several things happen in life, uh, just, just life things, Not, nothing bad at all, but it just huge things happen in, in the person's life. Uh, to where 
knowing from others that with whom I've talked when they've been in a similar situation, again, nothing, nothing bad happened here, but it has really benefited them to take a break from being on the schedule for a little bit uh, and, and then uh, get them right back in. And, and, I, and I encourage that with folks here. It, it, as, as folks know, if there's a situation where you just say, I, I've got too much, I, can I take some time off on being on the speaking schedule? Uh, no problem with that. I, we'll work with it. But I, I had seen situations like that, and this person was in that situation. So based on that and knowing that that person's life was going to be very, very filled with all kinds of things, I presumed, based on these, these facts, as I see in this slide, I presumed that he would want to break from the schedule. So I didn't schedule him on the next schedule. And then I called him afterwards uh, and told him, hey, you know, because of all these things that are going on in your, lives, I, your life, I, I'm giving you a break, this, ske this schedule. And he said, well, uh, we, actually we had this and this and this worked out, so I, I, I could have easily uh, continued serving on that. And I thought, okay, yeah. I, I, I acted presumptuously. I, I drew a conclusion based on a few things without talking to the individual that, that this would be best for that person. Uh, thankfully, I talked to him because he, he started thinking, well, did I mess up or something? Why, why am I taking off the schedule? Uh, but it, it's just an example of how even a, a, when you're in, in leadership and working with others, if, if, if we don't have that communication and talking, uh, misunderstandings can happen. And, and it was through, uh, it was unintentional, but it was, it was an act of presumptuousness that, that uh, resulted in that. This last point, as, as we look at Psalm 141, is, uh, is one th that I think, I mean, obviously, we recognize. But in, in going forward to avoid presumptuousness, uh, study, reflect upon, strive to develop what would be considered the opposite behaviors of presumptuousness. What, what, are, what are other opposites of presumptuousness? We, we know those. We'll, we'll talk about those here in a second. But, but here's one of those, those remedies, one, an opposite of how to avoid uh, presumptuous sins. Uh, Psalm, Psalm 141, Psalm 141, verse 3. Psalm 141 verse 3, he says, yeah, David says in this respect, and uh, I need to pray this more often and think more deeply about that, especially when I'm up speaking for an hour and eight minutes. Anyway, here we go. Uh, Set a guard, O eternal, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men who work in uh, iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Boy, we, we, we make presumptuous comments. Uh, Christ saying what's going to happen to him. And, and Peter just blurts out, that'll never happen to you. We're doing this and you're doing this. You're the Messiah. Uh, get behind me, Satan. He presumptuously said that he didn't have all the facts and just blurted out this statement. And, and, and Christ is telling him, this is, this is a statement that you've made that is, is what, what, where Satan is on things. Don't, don't think that way. It, it, our, our mouths can get us in so much trouble so quickly. He who guards his mouth preserves his life. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, uh, several Proverbs. Let's turn finally, let's wrap this up in Psalm 19. Let's go back to Psalm 19 because the passage in verse 13 has the, the solution to uh, avoiding, or to, to asking God to keep us back from going down that path of presumptuous sins. It's, it's found in the following verse. Psalm, Psalm 19, Psalm 19, we'll, we'll read verse 13 again. Psalm 19, verse, verse 13. Here are the, the opposites as, as we see this. Verse 13, keep, keep back your servant for, from presumptuous sins, these, these liberties, taking liberties, all these kinds of things. Uh, let them not have dominion over, over me. Uh, he's, now verse 14. Here's, here's how we do it. Let the words of my mouth, the things that I, am, I, I form with my mouth that come out to others, that come out to God, and the meditation of my heart, uh, 
the opposite of presumptuousness is that the meditation of, of our hearts and, and the words that come out of our, of our mouths as a result of the meditation of, of our heart are all acceptable in God's sight. We, we take it back to, I want to think in, in a way that pleases you. I want the words that come out of my mouth uh, to be based on the things upon which I've meditated and thought deeply because these things are acceptable in, in your heart. And this is always driving us as we're trying to get uh, to communicate with others. And, he, and he, uh, so, you know, it, it entails all these opposites, walking circumspectly, being careful to obey what we say upon what we meditate, what we think on in the depths of our innermost being to, to be acceptable in God's sight, not being self-willed, but yielded to God, yielded to others, as James 3 tells us, all of these things at, in, in, in looking to God, as we see at the end of this passage here, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. He says, you are my strength. The margin renders, you are my rock. This is what I want to do, God, because you are my rock and you are my redeemer. God's the one who redeems us through Christ. It's all up to him and our lives are all completely in his hands. So we want our thoughts, our, the meditations of our, our hearts and, and what comes out of our mouth to be acceptable in sight, in his sight. You know what? In doing so, brethren, we shall be innocent of great transgression.